Good morning and welcome to Christchurch Huntingdon's live stream. It's great to have you with us as we complete a little series on Luke chapter 15. So far we've been seeing, if you like, good news for bad people, that uh, there is rescue for those who put their trust in Jesus and who, as it were, return to the Father like the prodigal son. But actually today we're going to see a little bit of a sting in the tail, not just good news for bad people, but actually bad news for good people. So do listen in as we continue with our last part of Luke chapter 15, uh, the prodigal son's older brother, a much less well-known part of that story. But for now, a verse from Matthew chapter 9, and this is a verse, um, it's a similar kind of story to the prodigal son. It's Jesus meeting a tax collector, and uh, he says to those around him who are complaining at this kind of welcome of sinners, Jesus says this, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. Good news if you're sick, that there is a doctor for our souls, Jesus Christ. But bad news if we think that we are too good for God, or that we're fine as we are, and that we don't know, we don't need him at all. Our first song invites us to wake up, to wake up from our slumber. It's not that we're fast asleep right now, but that um, followers of Jesus and those who are investigating Christianity can so often be sleepy and slumbersome, if I can put it like that, um, forgetting that God is on the throne, that our God reigns and that he is the King of Kings. So uh, wherever you are, whether it's in a bus, uh, in your sitting room or kitchen, wherever you might be, um, jump up and uh, let's sing together this wonderful and rousing song.
Good morning, I'm Kerry ann Martin. I've been with Christchurch Huntingdon for a year and a half now. Um, today's reading is Luke 15, verses 25 to 32. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when, his, when the son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, let me read verse 11 as we go into our final section of Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two, two sons. We thought about the younger son last week. We're going to think about the older son this week. And this older son is often forgotten in this story of the prodigal son. Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we look at your word today, it will be like a mirror that shows us where we are acting like the Pharisees. Please, would you show us our sin and please, would you rescue us? In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you a cop or a robber? What do I mean by that? Are you someone who plays life by the rules or are you by nature someone who loves to be a little bit more flexible when it comes to authority and rule keeping? Are you a sinner or a saint? I don't mean that theologically, but um, do you uh, tend to do the right thing generally or do you tend to do the wrong thing? Now, temperamentally, I know that I am much more of a, uh, a saint than a sinner, um, probably compared to my sisters as well. Um, in fact, I found that often it was the, the rebels that got away with much more than the goody goodies. Um, but over these last two weeks, we've been looking in this oasis of grace. We've been looking at this wonderful message that Jesus reaches out to sinners. But the trouble is that some of us think of ourselves more as saints. And that was certainly the case for the Pharisees. Verse one and two. Now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered this man welcomes sinners and eats with them and that's why I believe that this last part of the story this older brother <clears throat> is actually this is where the sting in the tail of the story is this is where the main um, sort of payload of the uh, the bomb that Jesus drops um, really lands for the Pharisees this is where Jesus challenges us in our self-righteousness and uh, this is the, this is amazing teaching and it's an amazing story and uh, it will do us some real good if we take it to heart you see we've been seeing good news for bad people um, that sinners can be uh, welcomed but this is also bad news for good people when we think that we're okay so <clears throat> i've actually called this last section scandalous grace we've seen sensible grace that was the uh, Oh, where's he gone? The uh, the lost sheep. We've seen, uh, sorry, the first one was sensible grace, uh, saving the sheep. Uh, searching grace, searching for the coin. Last week, saving grace, the, uh, the prodigal son. And now scandalous grace. We're seeing that um, there's a, a bit of a, a, a sting in the tail for those who think that they are good, for the goody goodies, for the cops, for the saints. Um, as we look at how this older brother reacts to his younger, uh, younger brother. Well, we're going to see three things in this story, and uh, they all relate to this young older brother. And the first thing is that he is livid. 
he's livid. In other words, he is angry. Let's have a look at verse 25 to 28. Verse 25, meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. He hasn't, he hasn't been there at this point. He's been out um, doing his hard work. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So there's this father, this rich landowner with perhaps a huge country estate with fields stretching out to the horizon. And now, unfortunately, this massive estate has got a big fence down the middle of it because half of it has been sold off to pay for the younger son's inheritance so that he could go off on a bender in Thailand and um, spend all his money on um, no good cause. And the, the older son um, is away when this younger brother returns. He's out sort of on his quad bike doing some job in the field or whatever. And uh, and then the, the, the son, the the younger son comes back and uh, the elder son uh, turns up on the scene in verse 25. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Well, this is quite strange. There's like uh, the, the, the workers on the uh, this National Trust type property estate uh, are not doing their normal jobs. They're putting up a fireworks display. And he gets a bit suspicious because Hamish, the Aberdeen Angus, the pride of the estate who has been tipped in farming monthly to win the prize of Israel's fatted, fattest fattened calf, is not in his pen. And uh, there's drum and bass music echoing across the grounds and disco lights are being set up in the house. And there's the sound of champagne corks being popped and noises and voices and celebrations. And so he turns to one of the servants, one of the workers on the estate, and he says, uh, Look, what, what's going on? And this servant says, well, haven't you heard your brother's back? And he thinks that his brother's going to be really pleased, but that the, this older brother's face just turns to rage. Um, he's absolutely angry. And, um, and then the the father comes out and he sees him still sitting there on his high horse on his quad bike, motionless, looking like death warmed up. And you can t cut the tension with a knife. And in in verse 28, the father goes out and pleads with him. He sort of asks him, to, you know, come on in, come and enjoy the party. But he's angry. He's livid. Now, just before we sort of hurl abuse at the older brother and tell him to cheer up a bit and stop spitting with rage. I wonder if actually we would be any different. I wonder if we are any different. And it's worth just thinking about how shocking the story is again to, um, to feel this. This younger brother has invoked his dad's will before he's even dead. He's emptied half of the family's property into his bank account, headed off to Thailand with his debit card and wasted everything on his appetite, appetites. And now he comes back with this little sob story about how sorry he is. And he's kind of welcomed as if he's the best thing since sliced bread. I mean, hello, is it not just a bit out of order? I mean, maybe this older brother does have a point, doesn't he? Isn't he right to be angry? Have you ever been in that situation where you're, you're queuing up at the bank and I don't know who's at the front, but they, they've got a lot of money to cash in or something like that, or they're buying a house or something, but it's taking ages and you go, oh, you thought the queue would be quite short. And then the next person goes and they take ages and it's finally nearly your turn to go. And then someone else walks ahead of you and they get it, they get in there before you. It's, and the cashier doesn't even recognize that you're, excuse me i'm the, i've been queuing here all along well you you would be a bit livid wouldn't you and here's this brother who's wasted all this money on prostitutes which is how the the older brother puts it and he's welcomed i mean it is a bit unfair isn't it well let's just think about this the do you remember we saw that last week the younger son we said he was self-serving self-obsessed and self-deceived but actually is this lad any better is this older lad 
any better. Actually, he's very bitter towards his brother because his brother's getting all this stuff he doesn't deserve and that hasn't worked for. To, to, to quote the title of a book, what's so amazing about grace? Well, everything until the point when someone else is the recipient of it. And then it's easy to get very jealous. And of course, this older son is a picture of the Pharisees tut, tut, tutting as Jesus welcomes sinners and tax collectors and slaughters the fattened calf with them. They are just like this older son. They are angry. And actually, it's a perfect picture of us as well when we pride ourselves on how good we are. Someone then sneaks ahead of us without queuing and suddenly we erupt and it shows that uh, being a saint, we're not actually so saintly because we want to relate to the Father on the basis of performance. I've done all this stuff. I've worked hard. I've given money to the church. I've done this job. I've been slaving for you. I've been at this church ever since the day that we started and uh, or I've been on this committee or I've, you know, I've read my Bible every day. And you're saying that a prostitute can get away with doing none of these things and then is allowed into God's kingdom. That makes me mad. As uh, Chuck Colson was, uh, you might, if you know your US politics, was, uh, was known as President Nixon's hatchet man in the uh, the Watergate scandal. And when he became a Christian in 1973, from an outrageous background, his mother was irate. That was the word that Colson uses. His, uh, she said, I, his, um, this is what the mother said, his father and I raised our boy as a good Christian. He was baptised and now confirmed in the Episcopal, that's the Anglican Church. We taught him every Christian principle. Imagine saying he's just now become a Christian. Well, grace makes all religious duties and rituals worthless currency for getting into heaven. And if you're a saint, then grace offered towards a sinner can make you livid. But let's go on to the next few verses, because I think this is where it really starts to sink in. Let me move on to verse 29 or 30. Maybe you're, you're not convinced yet. Well, listen in to this as we move from he is livid to he is lost, verse 29 and 30. But he, that is the older brother, answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he doesn't say brother of mine, he says son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes. We don't actually know that. Maybe he did, but we don't. It doesn't say that in the story, but that's how his brother sees it. When the son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? As we analyse this older brother's language, we see that actually he is just as lost as his brother was when he was in the pigsty. It's all coming out now. He's really showing his true colours all those years amongst the cows and in the fields. And underneath, there's been this bitterness towards his father. First of all, he treats his father like a slave driver. Verse 29, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. It's um, so easy to fall into this Pharisee mode. God, why do you demand so much from me? Why do I have to do this and that for church? And why can't I have a break? Why is the Christian life so hard, so relentless? Can I have a holiday? I'm going to have a holiday from God this summer. It's stupid. Um, we sort of we sort of relate to God on the basis of what we've done. Lord, I, I go to church every week. That's more than other people in church do and more than my home group do. Lord, I'm I'm slaving for you. And what do I get in return? Look at what I'm doing for you. So easy to fall into ritual rather than relationship in our um, relationship with God. And, and, and I think this shows that he is lost. But not only does he treat his father like a slave driver, he treats him like a slot machine. I, I, I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. 
he kind of thinks that his father is like a sort of slot machine that if you kind of put in some rule keeping, some obedience, then you can entitled to pull the handle and you get what you like. And he's sort of put in um, his hard work and this time it doesn't seem to be working. And um, it can be the same for us. We can um, think that, you know, we God owes us something from all that we've done for him. We've been slaving for him. We've never one, put one foot out of line, which of course isn't true at all. Just look at his attitude to his brother. But I've put in my coins into the slot machine and I've pulled the handle and nothing's come out. As if what I do for God is um, means that I should get something. I remember a friend um, back back at university who was trying to get votes from people to become the president of some group at university and she was working so hard at it and she she didn't go to church much but she did come from a church background and she said well if I don't get this position I'm going to throw in my faith because I've worked so hard at this in other words if I don't get what God gives me then what if, if I don't get what I want then what good is God anyway and sometimes you meet people who say, well, I've tried Christianity, but it didn't work. What they mean by that was that God didn't give them what they wanted. Maybe that was an easy life or good health or a spouse or whatever it is, as if we're entitled to something. God is not some slot machine where we put in a good deeds, a respectable life. We pull the handle and everything will go automatically our way. This older son, I'm afraid, is lost. He's more lost than the younger brother was in the pigsty. So easy to relate to God on the basis of what we do and it turns us bitter towards God and angry towards others. Actually, there's no evidence that the father has withheld anything from his son. Um, verse 31, my son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But unfortunately, ritual has taken the place of relationship and this uh, boy is lost. These are such challenging words. I find them so challenging because one of the things about um, full-time Christian ministry is you can so easily slip into a mindset thinking that God owes you one because um, it takes me a long time to write my sermons and maybe I start to think that I'm doing something, paying for something from God and then when I don't get what I want, um, it becomes a duty rather than a joy. You, you see, I think it's more dangerous to be a, a saint than a sinner. It's easier to be rescued from a pigsty than it is from sitting on your moral high horse. At least in the pigsty, you know that you've mucked up, but sitting there on the quad bike, having sort of been slaving away, you think that you're okay and you have a blind spot to the fact that um, things are not all well in your relationship with the father. Well, there is there is good news for bad people in this chapter, but there's bad news for good people in this chapter, and that is that 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 we can be just as lost as the uh, the younger brother. But actually, there is one more thing, uh, and this is what we see. And actually, I think this is the most wonderful thing of all these four talks and all of this chapter. And it's this. Yes, he's livid. He's lost. But actually, he's loved. It's easy to miss that. But did you see that in how the father relates to his son? The father actually loves this, this older brother. He doesn't deserve anything. He's just so bitter and he's so annoying but the father so gently goes out to him he goes out to the younger son running after him and he goes out to the older son as well look at verse 28 the elder brother became angry and refused to go in so his father went out and pleaded with him this father is so kind and he's so kind to the older son as well he's loved he's loved he goes out he entreats him he beseeches him he urges him to come in to the party the father loves him as well the same in verse 31 my son 
you are always with me and everything I have is yours. There's, he, he, he may relate to his father like a slave driver in a slot machine, but the father wants a relationship with him. And I find this so moving. And um, we can we can forget all that is past. We can get off our high horse. We can leave our bitterness outside. We can come on in and we can celebrate. Verse 32, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Stop thinking about yourself, your own little empire. Stop counting all the little things that God owes you. Stop treating God like a slave driver who wants your labour. Start treating him like a father who loves you. I love it because in this passage, do you see Jesus is reaching out to the Pharisees here? He's pleading with them to come into the party. Stop grumbling that I eat with paedophiles and prostitutes and younger brothers who've um, figured out that I, I, I love people and I'd call them to turn around quicker than, than you do. And start rejoicing. Come home doesn't matter how bitter or angry or warped we've become like this older brother the father still wants us home he's livid he's lost but he's loved and at the end of this series as we turn to ourselves what about us i hope that we've been challenged by jesus today i hope that uh, luke 15 has been like a a mirror to us and perhaps we've seen a little bit how we so easily um, I like this older brother. But Jesus loves older brothers too. He doesn't want our slavery. He doesn't want our Sundays. He doesn't want our salaries or our spare time. He wants us. And actually that's one of the lessons of discipleship in this section of Luke's gospel. Chapter 14 verse 26 if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. D Jesus doesn't just want our slavery and our hard work. He wants our own hearts. Christianity is not about giving up a few things. Actually, that's quite easy. It's about giving up our lives, giving our hearts to God. Maybe someone's been in Christian circles all your life. You've grown up going to church, you've read your Bible, you've been to Sunday school, you've organised things for church, you've been on rotors, you've given a lot for God, but you haven't given him your heart. You're not a disciple. Well, he loves you and he calls you in. Turn away from religion and ritual and start a relationship with a father who holds no good thing back from you. Or maybe someone else's Christian life has gone cold. You've slipped into the older son mentality, relating to God on the basis of what you're doing for him, on the basis of your good works rather than on the fact that he loves you. And that's why you're so weary. Well, will you leave it all behind and come into the party? Will you stop looking down on other Christians whose faults you can spot and start treating them as brothers and sisters? Will you start reaching out to the lost rather than tut tutting them? Will you get off your high horse and humble yourself, remembering that a saint can mask an attitude that shows that you're just as rebellious as a sinner? Cops and robbers. In Luke 15, there are these two extremes. And I guess that most of us show a little bit of both in our lives, sinners and saints, cops and robbers. Most of us are sort of somewhere in between. But both, both extremes are lost, and so is everyone in between. But both are loved, and so is everyone in between. You see, the man who told these parables a few pages later gave up his life for all kinds of people on the cross. He died so that we can live. He was cut off so that we can go into the party. No one need be excluded, cop or robber. Well, how does this story end? Did the oldest son go in to the party? Well, we don't know. The story stops abruptly. And how about those Pharisees? How did they respond? And how about us? How will we respond? 
Let's have a moment of quiet to pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for ourselves and for each of us in our church that you would rescue us from our high horse, that you'd rescue us from our Pharisee-like hearts and that you'd flood our hearts with your grace. We thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's continue from what we've been hearing in prayer. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray that you would show us the many areas in which we have got things wrong, that we've put confidence in our own selves, in our abilities, and we may have even been tempted to climb a ladder up to you. We do pray that you would forgive us and that you'd help us to cast ourselves only on your grace. We pray that as a result of that, our lives would be marked by humility and generosity, that we wouldn't look down on others, but we would see that we're all in the same boat. We pray that this would transform our lives and our relationships will be full of kindness and compassion and generosity to those around us. We pray for Christchurch Huntingdon as a new term begins very soon. We pray that you'd enable us to gather back together, whether it be in online or in person. We pray that you would enable us to encourage one another and to speak even of this grace and kindness that you have shown us. May this generosity of you transform us and enable us to be generous to one another. We pray for any who are struggling or who are sick at this time. We pray that you would help them to trust in you, to trust your good plans for their lives. Please bring them up and strengthen them and take them out of the pit and put their feet on a rock. And we pray, Lord, for those who are uh, rejoicing at this time. Thank you for the good things that you give us in our lives. We pray, Lord, for those who are anxious or worried, please enable them to put their trust in you. And we pray again, Lord, for those who are in positions of leadership, in authority, whether in uh, local councils or local government or in the national government. Please give wisdom to those in authority. Help them to make wise decisions that would govern your people well the Collect, the Church of England prayer for today. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things which we're not worthy to ask. But through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to have our final song now. It's a great one to uh, close our service and, in fact, to close this series together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus, who taught this parable 2,000 years ago, is alive and with us today and we can know him, and we can rejoice in him. So let's stand and sing of his great love for us.
sins and my sorrows He made them His very own He bore the burden to Calvary And suffered and died alone Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, for tuning in to this service. And uh, you don't have to dash away because although it's the end of the service, if you follow the instructions at the end of the service, you'll see where we will be meeting online um, through Zoom to uh, be able to catch up with one another um, informally and face to face, albeit not quite fully face to face. Um, though if you tune in, you might find out quite what, uh, when that will next be possible. I'm actually recording this at the end of July, so much may have changed uh, by the end of August. Um, and if you tune into Zoom, you'll be able to find out um, all the latest news. We're going to finish in just a moment with a, a final prayer. But a huge thank you to those who've made these recordings and these services possible. A special thank you to Igor for doing all of the editing for us. And um, thank you to all who took part in today's service. Let's pray together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Father, through these services, we've learnt more about our sinfulness, our wickedness, the ways in which we've slammed the door in your face, or we've been proud like Pharisees. But we've also seen your amazing kindness reaching out to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that our lives would be truly changed, that we might worship you in all that we do. Please go before us into the, the day and into the coming week and term. May we be more, a little bit more like Jesus in our generosity to others and in our delight in his amazing grace. We pray all this in his name. Amen.